Good evening, campers. Welcome to Radio Camp Half Blood. I'm your host, Zach. I'm B. And this week, we're digging up an old book that's one of my favorites. We're reading Holes by Louis Sakar. Yeah. Or Saker. Or I, think it, it, I think it's Sakar. Sakar? Maybe. Sakar? Possibly. I used to think it was Satcher, but I'm pretty sure it's not. So I've just pronounced that inside my brain wrong for a decade. All I know is. Everyone knows the story. Like, you can ask anyone. You can always go, digging up them holes, dig it. Oh, no. That's going to be stuck in my head forever. <laughs> and people will know what you're talking about. Yeah. How familiar are you with this book? I didn't read the book as a kid, so this is my first time actually reading it. I watched the movie a lot, though. I kind of was just glued to the Disney Channel when I was a kid. Like, mostly just would flip between Nickelodeon and Disney over and over so I pretty much watched Holes, like, at least once a year or whenever it was on. And then if, like, they were playing it a lot, a specific week, I would sometimes watch it, like, more than once. So, yeah, reading this, it was funny because uh, the book is is so connected to the movie in my mind. So, like, all of the... It's one of the most faithful adaptations ever. Yeah, it's super faithful. Um, I feel like the only movie i've seen that's more faithful to the book that's like almost exactly the same is if you have you ever read or watched the five people you meet in heaven by uh mitch album no i haven't it's like okay it's like an okay book and it's an okay movie honestly it's like a little bit schmaltzy but yeah the movie has john voight in it and it's basically like almost verbatim the same as the the book um like the setup of it yeah no i mean i guess look i would consider one of the most faithful book to movie adaptations is kurt vonnegut's slaughterhouse five which that book is so batshit insane yeah i've heard of it i've never actually read it though i know uh, both of them are really really good it, it depends have you ever read a kurt vonnegut book before? i've only read i started reading like a short story collection that my sister's boyfriend has. oh uh probably the uh welcome to the monkey um, house no it was like a pretty uh, recent one hold on i have to like google it now yeah i mean that was one of the most faithful adaptations i've ever watched uh but i think this comes the most faithful because there is really nothing they cut out maybe to kill a mockingbird but they move scenes around Unfortunately. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, to kill him. And they also cut out a lot of stuff. Yeah, didn't they cut out the thing about um, Mrs. DeBose? Yeah, they cut that out. Like, it's. Like, I think for me, like we'll get into the movie later because we're going to be filming a commentary on this. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I feel like the movie actually is slightly better than the book because they complement the story in a way that makes it much more appealing and also has my main problem with this book. We'll, we'll get to. I think they handled it much better in the movie than they did in the oh, book. Oh, I just f figured something out. Uh, Sakar wrote the script for the movie. That's probably why it's so faithful. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, I think the first, if I remember correctly, this might be totally wrong. The first script they had was so bad because it was like, we'll set it in the apocalypse and stuff. I think that was like the, the first idea of this book. A uh, movie was they're gonna put a twist to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess it's not necessarily true that if the um the author makes the the script that it'll be faithful because actually like John Green has been known to um he wrote like a long time ago a screenplay for Looking for Alaska and it was super different than the book. Well, I mean, it's it's really hard to do. I, we'll 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 get into it in the commentary, but this is just a short little diatribe before you know we start really this review is that. A lot of books, there's so much that does not work because a lot of it is internal monologues when you can just show it visually. Right, because what do you even show when you have that monologue? Like, you'd have to have some sort of thing happening on the screen. It's, like, not super dynamic. Yeah, no, and the hardest part, though, about it is is getting your message out both visually, like, having audio and, you know, having a, an actor's performance that isn't just verbatim. Because sometimes, like, writing something is much different than saying it. Yeah. I remember when I took a creative writing class in high school, we talked about, like, the concept of, like, the bathtub, where it's, like, you want your story to be the person gets out of the bathtub and do does something. They're not just sitting in a bathtub thinking about something, I guess. And it's, like, it's it's much harder to, like, take something that's all internal monologue and figure out what to do with that visually i mean there's always like narration and stuff but you still have to like have some sort of visually compelling thing going on on the screen yeah no especially actually with this book a lot of the stuff is there's very little descriptive language but if you can understand what a hole looks like in the desert you can pretty much set up this entire location yeah i mean it's it's like a very evocative setting because it's this 
vast expanse of like dry lake bed filled with holes and there's no vegetation to be seen no shade and i like the um the first page uh, of the first chapter where they like describe that the warden owns the shade <laughs> like yeah, the warden owns the shade because uh, there's only two oak trees and then the oak tree has a little hammock. Has a hammock and then only the warden's allowed on the hammock so like the only shade is basically just belongs to the warden and no campers are allowed on i think for me this book i grew up loving the movie but also loving the book because uh for me i grew up in like rural new mexico where there was it was it's not like it's central texas because in central texas it is hotter than sin and there's nothing to do because people that don't live in the united states you can see the map uh texas is like ungodly big yeah it's so big it, it, all directions yeah it, it takes instead of like hours because i know you live on the east coast like just to get from one state to the other could be you know an hour or 45 minutes yeah the east coast especially is like where i live it, you don't really have to drive too far to get to like pennsylvania new jersey connecticut you know even massachusetts like all of those states are still within like driving distance where it's like not super crazy, but Texas, you can drive for like four hours and you're still in Texas. And I think that's what complements this is it's like uh, Louis Sackar, uh, he writes a lot of, st- I'm not sure, have you read any of his other books like Sideways Stories from the Wayside School or Fuzzy Mud? Uh, you had mentioned it to me. I actually, I, yeah, I've never read any of his stuff, in- including Holes. I, my sister read Holes uh, when we were like, you know, grade school age, like whatever age you would read a book like this, like chapter books. Maybe she even did, like, a book report on it or something for class. But I I never got around to it for whatever reason. Yeah, I love all of his books, even though a lot of the themes are just kids in a school. And they just, you know, trying to be the best, you know, good-mannered and just always funny. Sideways Story from the Wayside School is actually one of my favorite books. Because it's just, it's like a a collection of short stories about kids. Uh, I was doing a little research. There's not really much about... The interesting thing about Louis Sakar is he doesn't like write through inspiration. He just likes writing. Like he puts kids in these settings and sees where it takes it. And I like that in this book because it's almost like Back to the Future with um, Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale and how they wrote that and how everything like there's not any uh, thrown away dialogue that is just completely thrown away. It actually has like a build up and then has a payoff at the end. There's a lot of like interconnected plot stuff going on. There's like no plot point that exists for no reason everything has like a specific connection to something else and like i do think that sometimes you can like overdo that like my example of this is always like if you've ever seen the movie signs and how it's like everything oh it's like the water because the aliens are allergic to water like it you know what i mean and like and the baseball yeah and then his wife swing away johnny swing away yeah and the baseball bat because you could kill them with baseball like that okay you can and the wooden doors because aliens have traveled billions of light years can't get past the door yeah that yeah it's a dumb movie but it's it's kind of that thing where it's like sometimes you could be so like over the head with like um foreshadowing and like the interconnected plot point stuff where it's like everything has to have a reason and like that could have like a like a whimsical effect on your story or you could feel really like stupid and over the top and i think that this but i think here because um I think, well, with this book, I feel like because a lot of the purpose, one of the main themes has always has been about time in this book, is that it works really great with time travel stories. I'm going to keep using Back to the Future, but with this as well, is, you know, you have, like, some throwaway dialogue such as, you know, when they actually get to the peaches, actually, that's, like, in the past, there's the peaches, and then when they're in the behind the boat, of course, there's the... They're canned peach, not canned, but, you know, they're... Like the um, jars of the peaches, yeah. Pickled peaches at this point. Like, really gross. Yeah, like, but, you know. sludge. <laughs> yeah, sl- I feel like you would die from eating that. Yeah, but that's just I'm pretty sure you would probably Because it's all, not only is it, like, uh, like 150 years it's old, like but, like, <laughs> for a long time. Been yeah. sitting in the sun the entire yeah, time. Do you, do you want botulism? Because that's how you get botulism. Uh, so the story opens up with good old Stanley Yelnaz, you know, average tw- i'm gonna skip it's is probably 12 years old everyone's 12 in the world of ya <laughs> average 12 year old kid who thanks to his no good rotten pig stealing grandfather or great grandfather i'm so sorry uh he's been his entire family has been cursed with terrible bad luck and stanley was at the wrong place at the wrong time yeah so um yeah they kind of make a point to say that the whole like no good great great grandfather 
joke is like a an inside family thing that they say whenever anything goes wrong but to a certain extent they kind of start to believe it especially with all of the bad luck they tend to have so his dad um has like been trying to like make a a use for old sneakers basically and he's had like no luck with his inventions um they they do like an explanation of like uh an inventor needs three things they need to be smart they need to be perseverant and they need a little bit of luck and he's like had all of those things except he hasn't had any luck yep as well as uh <laughs> stanley's great great grandfather who won a lot of money in the stock and market lost it and all. yeah lost it all not because of the, the crash but because he was robbed by a uh, kissing kate bartlett right uh, that's kissing Kate Barlow. Barlow, that's what it is. I was very close. Clearly. I was getting confused with uh, Marlow, but um, I don't know. It's KB. Yeah, kissing. Old Kate. Dan loves little Ann. Yeah. So yeah, on his way from I guess New York to California, she steals all his money. But uh, yeah. So and she leaves him completely uh for dead, and he somehow survives, and all he can keep saying is the God's thumb. Right, which you will find out later what that means. Other than the ramblings of a man with heat stroke. <laughs> <laughs> you mean a melted brain? Yeah, because that does sound like something someone would say if they were like full on just like experiencing really bad like dehydration. Like it was God's thumb that saved me. Like, okay, that whatever you say, buddy. So the interesting thing I love about Stanley is his his full name is Stanley Yilnaz. And they always made bring this up in the point even early on in the book that Stanley uh, Yilnaz is Stanley spelled backwards. Yeah, like a palindrome. And he's like the fourth of his family. I mean, if if my last name was Yelnats, I would probably like to have the first name Stanley because it's like a very it's very fun to have a palindrome as a name. Uh, so I should just be called Taco Cat, Taco Cat, or Race Car, Race Car, or Auto Sit on a Potato Pan Otis. <laughs> that sounds like such a beautiful name to have on like a placard. I just imagine like that kid graduating, someone just like auto <laughs> Uh the way they characterize him is he's kind of he's a very like passionate person, but he gets picked on a lot, mostly because of his weight. And because of this, this hits the whole situation in, in gear. Uh Stanley, a kid at his school, bullies him and throws his notebook in a toilet. Thus Stanley was late to meet the bus, so he had to walk home and he decided I'm gonna take a shortcut on the way to his never house. Never take a shortcut. No, never. Stay out of the woods, stay out of pretty much anywhere that looks creepy, such as a dark, dirty alley. Uh unless your name is Bruce Wayne, then please do, because we need crime fighters. <laughs> you need an origin story. <laughs> we need an origin story. Stanley didn't have an Uncle Ben. I guess the moral of the story is have killable parents. Really? Is that the moral? <laughs> I never really thought that the moral of, of Batman was it's good to have parents that die. I don't think... <laughs> D- am I half a crime fighter? <laughs> well, no, because if Bruce Wayne died in that situation, they had a story about this. His dad would have become Batman and his mom would have become the Joker. Yeah. So no one can win. And also that's, that is a fixed point in the DC universe. You can't not have Batman or nothing will happen. So, moral of the DC universe, Batman has very killable parents. Oh, yeah. Well, um, it's the same thing with Spider-Man, right? Where Uncle Ben always does, no matter what. Yeah, he has to. Man, they like killing off relatives. Yeah, same as how Walt Disney liked killing off mothers. Yeah, well, it, it makes for an interesting story, <laughs> I guess. Well, also, he had guilt because he accidentally bought a house. Or he bought a house and didn't realize it had very poor insul- uh, ventilation and he accident accidentally killed his mom whoa really is that walt disney's origin story yeah that's crazy yeah he bought a house for his parents and uh there was a gas leak in the house and it killed his mom and so that's why every disney movie is about dead parents because he him him airing his guilt i'm joking i'm sure it's not that but uh well stanley is walking walking down the street you know Making his way downtown, walking fast. Faces passing him home. Do 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 do. Uh, and then some shoes fell on him. <laughs> if it could fall into this guy, then he would get caught. No, I can't rhyme. So the, these shoes fall on Stanley, and it's his lucky day because his dad has been working on this new invention to recycle old smelly sneakers. So he he sees it as as some sort of fate, 
And then, like a doofus idiot, he starts running, and then the cops are like, hey, those shoes are stolen, so you're a criminal. Because he didn't get the smelly ticket. He's not going to be meeting Slugworth, and he's not going to be going to the smelly chocolate factory. Good day, sir. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so he's arrested, and it turns out that these shoes were owned by a famous baseball player yeah, uh, named Sweet Feet. Sweet Feet, which is ironic, because the shoes smell real bad. <laughs> Yes, because, as we'll find out later, he has a terrible foot fungus. Ugh. Disgusting. <laughs> it's so grody. But, now, I guess this is where, I guess, the story gets flipped upside down. <laughs> now he became the prince of a place called Camp Green Lake? I don't know. No, so, uh, Stanley, in an... Uh, the only way I could use the best way, and with the best shit-eating grin on my face, he had a, a series of unfortunate events. <laughs> and... So Stanley was a huge fan of Sweet Feet. His dad was trying to make stuff uh, to make shoes smell better. Uh, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and no one believes him. So guess what that means? Good old-fashioned jailhouse Prison. injustice. Or or not. He's Yeah, basically, uh, so his parents don't uh, get him a lawyer because they can't afford it. So they're just like, just tell the truth. And then he does tell the truth, and he sounds crazy because he says that shoes basically fell from heaven and landed upon him and he thought it was a sign and that's why he ran and like likely story and so the judge doesn't believe him and also like he seems like a real jerk because the shoes were for like an auction for a homeless shelter where a bunch of rich people were going to buy it for like a lot of money and then like donate to homeless kids so pretty much stanley yilnaz is the worst human being in the eyes of the jury yeah in the eyes of the jury not to mention his like hero like favorite baseball player gets to like testify on the stand that it, those are his shoes and then he has to like seem like a total jerk in front of him and that stanley yilnaz is an inhumane monster for stealing from orphans yeah or just imagine kids. your hero telling like saying this to your face yeah it's kind of like the worst case scenario the last possible thing you would want to happen but there is a tiny glimmer of hope because he doesn't have to go to prison he has another option he doesn't he can go to camp yay camp fun and games oh camp fun and games it's right next to the super fun fair and cotton candy palace yeah um so they're like all right you can go to camp green lake and he's like i don't know what that is i don't really know, know anything can about I, it can i do my research please and like no you got like 10 yeah, seconds they're, they're like no you gotta decide like right now because it fills up real fast so are you coming or not to this camp you've never heard of um okay let's go to the camp and then it has a fade out and you cut to, I think, I remember the shot, like, night and day is the super wide shot, the establishing shot of Camp Crystal Lake, or Green Lake. Green Lake. I'm going to keep calling it Crystal Lake. I haven't said Crystal Lake. I think only you have said Crystal is, Lake. Is, is Crystal Lake a drink? I think No, Camp I, Crystal Lake is the camp in Friday the 13th. Oh, that's what you're thinking of. I think, I thought Crystal Lake was possibly a brand of bottled water. Oh, you're thinking of uh, Arrowhead water. I feel like Crystal Lake is definitely a brand of bottled water. Uh, so there's like that huge, wide, establishing shot of Camp Green Lake. And it's just, you just see this little bus in the middle of nowhere. And you just see millions of holes. Yeah, just stretching as far as the eye can see. And then that awesome music starts playing. <laughs> yeah, the, the rap song that they wrote specifically for this movie. Oh, wait, no, that's later. So it is like... There's no reason you could escape from this place. There's no wires. There's no fences. Because if you leave, you will literally die. Not from just, you know, dehydration, but also from, you know, pesky critters, as we'll find out later. Uh, so, you know, they're driving down, and they finally get to the camp after, like, four hours. And this is where Stanley gets to meet, you know, the good old friend of the children, Mr. Sir. So, yeah, so he gets to meet Mr. Sir, and we're introduced to him with a big old fat, like, sack of sunflower seeds. Because he has recently quit smoking. Um, un if, if no one has ever met someone that has quit smoking, they're pretty grumpy and yeah, very it's, anxious. It's a pretty difficult time. Uh, it's really funny because I like all I could think of uh, when they introduced Mister Sir was Sir from the Miserable Mill and Unfortunate Events, and he's constantly smoking. So and so, this is either a prequel or like afterwards. Afterwards, when he's quit his cigar and now he's just. A warden, or no, he's a a camp proprietor. Camp administrator. Yeah, that's what he is. Whatever. I don't know his specific title of this weird, creepy work camp for children, 
Where they dig holes for no reason to build character. Oh, yeah, to build all that character. So Mr. Sir takes him around, shows him all the horrible things, and he gives him his two jumpsuits that are orange and his shovel. And the reason why they're digging holes is if you dig a lot of holes and you're a bad boy, and you dig a lot of holes, you'll become a good boy. Somehow. That's how that works, right? Yeah. You know, no counselorship or anything. Just... Are they looking for anything? Well, we don't know yet. No, I mean, uh... it's, it, it would imagine you would want to do some just imagine trying to get that funding we want to build a, a camp where they just dig holes in the middle of central texas <laughs> right honestly I, I wouldn't be surprised if certain political parties would fund that not to not to name names well this is also is texas where you know go to prison and it's pretty much like rolling in vegas that prison system not a good time that's when we get to introduce to a bunch of uh, colorful characters. Colorful such characters. Whimsical nicknames. Nicknames. Whimsical, possibly. Oh, uh, we'll meet good old-fashioned armpit, x-ray, yeah. zigzag, squ- squid. Squid, zero, magnet. Barf bag. Oh, and barf. Well, we don't meet barf bag. We are, we are alluded to barf bag <laughs> for he slept in stanley's bed or cot or whatever before he left and the reason why he's not there anymore is he got bit by a rattlesnake intentionally to leave (laughs) yes as long as it wasn't a yellow spotted lizard well yeah because that then you'll definitely die if you get bit by a a yellow spotted lizard a slow painful death which i actually like the idea of the yellow spotted lizard even though it's not a real thing there's actually only uh two poisonous lizards in all of north america can you name them (laughs) So one of them is the Gila monster, and then okay. one of them is the Mexican bearded lizard. Mexican bearded lizard. And that's in Mexico, I assume. <laughs> or does it sneak its way to Texas? Like, I feel like lizards don't really care about borders. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're arbitrary. Lizards don't need no passport. <laughs> yeah, so we're introduced to all these wonderful people who, their names are kind of like their personalities as well, such as X-Ray, he's got glasses, and you can see right through people. Uh, we have Armpit. We have the, I guess, the best way to put it, he's a big, fat, smelly guy. Who smells like a... Uh, Twitch, which tw- we'll see Twitch later on, but, you know, he's very, uh, has ADHD. So. Twitchy. Twitchy, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there's also Magnet, which he's very kleptomaniac. Yeah, he's, he's a shoplifter guy yeah. or whatever, yeah, klept- kleptomaniac. His fingers are like magnets. Yeah, and, and Zero um, is like a pun on his last name. We'll get to that later. But also, he's like kind of seen as a Zero in the camp. He doesn't talk a lot, uh, and everyone kind of makes fun of him, though he's like really weirdly talented at digging holes. Yes, like he eats the dirt. <laughs> Ew. I feel like there's a video game like that. No, there's a joke in the book about this. Like, he doesn't eat the dough. He's like a mole. He eats it out. Dirt. No, moles don't eat dirt. That's worms, you idiot. Yeah, worms eat dirt. I don't think moles eat dirt. This is. I feel like <laughs> this podcast is turning to just us admitting we don't know anything about zoology. Because uh, <laughs> I don't know what moles do. I don't know what they're doing down there. I, I never said that we were experts about anything. So here we are. And what would be your camp name be if i had a nickname uh if you had a nickname yeah i mean we kind of talked a little bit about this i mean like the obvious one is bumblebee because i am b oh it's funny because shia labeouf was in the transformers movie oh yeah that's true he was um and and i guess the other option is is casper because i'm i'm real real pale so i wouldn't be pale for long if i went to to camp green lake i would be red (laughs) Like a cherry tomato. They might call me tomato. <laughs> or red. Or red. Yeah. Something like that. Uh, for me, I don't know what it would be. I think... I mean, I have a nickname at work, so it's really funny. They call me old man, even though I'm like 22. Because you're an old person, deep in your heart. Let's see. What other ones would probably be... Would uh, I don't know. Yeah, I can't think... I mean, like, maybe... Yours would be something like Snow White because you're constantly having adorable interactions with animals. Hello there, yellow spotted lizard. Oh, don't give me any kisses today. <laughs> yeah, the spotted litter- lizard's just like perched gently on your shoulder and you're just like singing a beautiful little song. Whistle while we work. Do, 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 do. And then someone just throws a shovel at me. Yeah, all, all the animals in this aren't quite as cute. 
I just have like my jumpsuit just becomes like a Disney princess dress. But it's like still orange. Is there? I wonder if there's fan art of like Disney princesses as if they're in holes. I mean, statistically, probably there's Disney princess art of every fandom because that's just the way of the universe. I mean, I've seen the one of my favorite ones, the Disney princess art of them as Velociraptors and cement mixers. Yeah, I saw that one. Jeez. Oh, the inner. So if anyone knows, I should probably look it up after this. So their job is in the next morning, Stanley has to wake up at the ass crack of dawn at good old 430 because it's the least hottest part of the day. The worst time to wake up. I woke- I, used, I used to wake up at that time when I worked at Dunkin' Donuts and it was terrible. And I wasn't even like out in the sun all day. I was just serving ungrateful people their frappuccinos. Wait, they don't sell frappuccinos at Dunkin' Donuts. I'm a fraud. No, they sell Dunkachinos. What are you talking about? They sell they sell Dunkachinos or uh culottos. <laughs> oh god. Uh <laughs> I said that like it was an advertisement. Culottos <laughs> available now. Your like local Dunkin' Donuts. Dun- DDs, <laughs> where is my check? I don't want to be sponsored by them. <laughs> No, the only one that they were sponsored by was Jack and Jill. Oh, no. Was Jack and Jill sponsored by Dunkin' Donuts? There's the whole movies about uh, Adam Sandler trying to get uh, Al Pacino to be in a Dunkin', Jer- Dunkin Donuts commercial. Because there's the part where like, he wow, has, say hello to my chocolate blend. <clears throat> That's really weird. That entire, it's just Adam Sandler trying to get a vacation for free and gets to hang out with Al Pacino. So yeah, so they wake up and it's, even before the sun decides, yeah, I'll come up in like a few hours. So, you know, they get their really sad breakfast and they start digging their holes and the holes have to be five feet deep and five feet wide. So that's why you use your shovel as a measurement. Um, and an x-ray specifically has his own special shovel that he claims is his own because he claims... That it's ever so slightly shorter than the other ones. So if he measures his hole with that shovel, then he doesn't have to shovel as much. No, he does Um, not. And the first hole is always the hardest. Just like the first cut is the deepest, I guess. Because, you know, everyone's... I've had this... Like The weirdest thing about reading this book is I was like reminiscing about weird things that I totally remember now. As a kid, I want... I'm not sure if it was because of the movie. I don't think it might have been, but not really. I don't know. But I remember wanting to dig a hole to China. Yeah, you told me this. I feel like I always wanted to do that, but it never quite worked out. I think I got about six feet in before I realized it was stupid hard work. Yeah, well, like, I live on a hill. Like, well, like, the house I grew up in is on a hill. So it would have been, like, really weird and difficult to, like, dig a hole in my yard. Also, my mom would have murdered me. Um... And I would try to, like, do the whole dig the hole to China thing, like, when I would go to the beach. But that's kind of, like, the worst place to try to do that because it's just sand and so it kind of just fills in. And then you try to, like, dig it with the wet sand and then the water just washes it away. It doesn't It doesn't really work out. We never really get that deep. Oh, yeah, you never do. And then the water seeps in because, you know, the water is in the ground and, uh. Yeah, exactly. So there's really... Oh, wait, I know why. Okay, deep. I think I remember now why I wanted to dig to China. It's going to sound so stupid because I saw the movie The Core... <laughs> So you were trying to get to the center of the earth? Yeah. <laughs> what, what were you planning on doing when your shovel started to melt? I didn't think that or far ahead. Or your body. Like your special, I don't know, heat resistant suit. My vibranium shovel. Yeah, that's that's what kids do, though. They don't really think ahead. No, that's... In- like, I'll, I'll shovel to the other side of the world. You took geology, you know. <laughs> well, also, it's like a weird thing. There's like weird parallels between like Stanley and me. Like it, we'll get more into, but it's like I used to live pretty much like in rural New Mexico where uh, we lived on a ranch and pretty much it was flat like this to an extent. So, you know, just digging out in the hot ass sun all day and getting no results. Is Stanley from New York? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Because they say that his family's from New York and then he gets like robbed when he goes through Texas. Yeah, he gets like expedited to... But they would have Texas. been living in California, but they don't. So I'm I'm assuming it's New York. It sounded kind of like and New they York. Prob- actually, in the movie, I think it was. Or at least uh, San Antonio or someplace. Stanley starts digging. And again, you know, the mysticism of digging a hole slowly vanishes as you realize it's a lot of work 
to dig a hole. Yeah, especially for someone like Stanley, who's like pretty clearly out of shape. He's a city and, born I mean, like, he, folk. Yeah, he like uses his own weight to kind of like leverage the dirt out, but then it's like the whole logistical issue of like making sure that the dirt isn't within the confines of like the shape of his hole that he's digging, and then it just sort of starts to cave in, and he gets like stressed about it, and his hands start bleeding. It's like a very gross, bad time. I could really like feel the sense of like exhaustion when I was reading this passage yeah um, especially like because i know that i would <laughs> and i would do so poorly oh i would not be able to do this like I, this. Just be like, I would not be able to dig a hole that deep i would give up immediately i would be like i'd like to go to prison please yeah just like take me to prison i don't care just take me away i don't want to be outside i'd rather be in an air-conditioned prison cell yeah seriously fine whatever Sh- shank me with a shiv i just don't really want to be outside in the sunshine i can't do it i have very weak arms <laughs> i'm such an introvert i'd rather stay in prison <laughs> not so much i'm such an introvert i'm such a weak small person but uh so stanley finishes last zero finishes first and th- yeah zero is like a prodigy when it comes to digging holes is that a prodigy that's not really it's like oh my son is very talented at digging holes all right well that's a completely useless talent Just, he puts on a job application Ooh, hector zeroni hmm i see your hobbies are digging holes and your education is camp green lake where you dug holes because you're a criminal because you stole some shoes so they go back to the rec room afterwards because it's hot hotter than dirt and Everything in the whole place is like terrible, and I think this yeah is... that they they spell wreck with w r e c k instead of r e c because it's just it's just a mess in there. Like Stanley kind of reflects on the fact that like this is the only place they have to like actually relax after this like grueling manual labor they have to do during the day and just everything's destroyed like the pool table's all messed up and the like all the felt is peeling off of it with like people's names carved into it and like it looks like someone like put their foot through the tv and everything's just a mess yeah and then that night they because every night they have to have like mandatory like counseling sessions with mr pendansky 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 the three easy words pendansky Pendansky. And they kind of talk about like what they want to do when they grow up and Magnet is like, I'd like to work with animals and everyone kind of laughs at his idea. Yeah, that's kind of mean. Everyone's a little mean to each other in this. Well, I mean, there, it's a bunch of people that have delinquents and also kids are also really mean to each other. Or no, they're all delinquents. They're both. They're juvenile delinquents. <laughs> My point was that they were delinquents. But you also have to remember kids can be terrible to each other. Oh yeah, I remember. <laughs> I'm not surprised. I'm just like it it sounds like a bad time for everyone. Um they're pretty hard on uh Stanley at first. Yeah, but you know, quickly, you know, you know, Stockholm syndrome kicks in. Yeah. And they start to accept him and They even give him a nickname. One of the rules at the camp is if you find anything interesting, you get the whole day off. Just one day. So, yeah, so he finds um I think his second day digging a hole, he finds like a fossil. Yeah, a little fishy fossil. And then he's like, is this interesting? And then the warden's like, nope. no. <laughs> because originally Camp Green Lake used to be an actual lake before it dried up. And then this is where, because we're on the second day, that we start to get a flashback of the past. The first time, which I like it like this more of that it's incorporated in the text rather than it being a separate chapter. Yeah, they kind of like flash um, back and forth between different. Because how boring would it be? Because you understand how the first time, you know, digging a hole, you don't need to explain again and again. Yeah, they don't want to belabor that too much. I like this little story they have about, you know, Stanley's great, great, great grandfather who was no good rotten pig stealing. But this is pre-pig stealing, so he's just his great, great grandfather. He's like a 16 year old who's in love or he, I think he's even younger. I think he might even be 15. Like, they're pretty young in this story. It's kind of ridiculous. It's like a Romeo and Juliet thing. That has pretty much the same result. You know you're like getting old when those kind of stories are just kind of make you roll your eyes. Like, no, you don't love this person. You are a child. So Elliot lives in the old country of Latveria? Latvia? Latvia. Wait. Latveria. I think Latveria is the uh, made up country that dr doom rules oh i thought you were gonna say it's the made-up country that latka is from from taxi oh that'd be cool too though wait where is he from 
some other it's, place. It's like the joke is that he's just foreign. Yeah, they do say the name of the country, but it's like vague. It's kind of like Fez from That 70s Show. It's the same thing. He's not from anywhere specific. Yeah, Latveria is the fictional country that Doctor Doom rules. Yeah, not that place. This is, that's not. We're not talking about that place. You know, they're really poor, and uh, so Elia is in love with the beautiful woman, or actually not woman. I'm sorry, little girl, because she's only 14. He just wants to marry her and have the fairy book wedding, except their dad doesn't want to give him his hand in marriage unless he has something to offer, such as a fat pig. Because he wants to marry his daughter off to this jerk guy who has a big fat pig that is more appealing to the, her father. What's the name of the old guy again? I, I always want to call him Bobinski, but that's, <laughs> that's not true. Not that's Bobinsky, not Coraline. Yeah, it's Coraline. <laughs> Hold on a sec. Um, she was even older than Igor Barv- yeah, yeah, Igor. Barvkov. It's pronounced Igor. I was going to do my Igor voice, but I'm just going to like wait until the Madame Zeroni. Master. Like, kind of. Uh, yeah. I, I guess more it turns more into like a Peter Lorre impression. Yeah, but Peter Lorre Peter. kind of is Igor, right? It's the same deal. No, uh, the most. So the first version of Igor was Bella Lugosi. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Well, the first version of Igor actually is. People don't really realize this, but the original Igor is not from the original Frankenstein. That's actually, his name's Fritz. The original Igor is played by Bela Lugosi, and that was in Son of Frankenstein. The more you know. The more you know, yes. This man's gonna marry his daughter off to the person who has the fattest pig, because ye oldy, old worldy values. Yeah, weird, creepy times of bartering your child as if they were chattel. Gross. So... Elia is so mad at this, he storms off to meet his good old friend, the fortune teller, Madame Zeroni. Yeah, who's, um, they, <sighs> do they call her a gypsy woman? Because I feel like that's, Yes, they yeah. call her the one-legged gypsy mm, woman. Yeah, not the best thing to say. They also call her Egyptian. I, I can just say she's the one-legged Romani. Yeah, but they also say she's Egyptian, which is, like, complicated, because, like, the word gypsy comes from, like, a bastardization of... I'm not going to defend that. Some people do take offense to it, but it's like, if you want something that's like old mysticism of Europe, that's what you always go to, especially I like I mean, when- it was super popular, I think, back then. To, I, I've actually been re-watching um, like a, a Let's Play of the video game uh, Psychonauts, and there's also a gypsy curse in that. So that's, it's a real common thing. They're like, we need something spooky, but it's kind of foreign, but also white people, but also not because she's not white in this. So I don't really know what they're going for. Is she Egyptian? Is she Romani? There's there's stuff like that, especially like if I'm going back to old horror movies, The Wolfman with Lon Chaney, all the people there were Romani or e- gypsies. We're just going to use, we're not going to really use the word gypsy because it's like, I would consider it a misnomer. Yeah, it's a mis- and it's also some people aren't a big fan of it. The moral of the story is an old fortune, t- one-legged fortune teller is, do, do you just want to take it off me? Take it away. <laughs> Madame Zeroni uh, lives on the outskirts of town. And she's, like, buddies with Elia for some reason, even though she's, like, in her 70s or something. And also looks like Eartha Kitt. Well, I mean, in my mind, she looks like Eartha Kitt, because that's clearly who she is. Just, I mean, that's perfect casting, what they did. Like, total perfect casting. I wouldn't have picked anybody else for that character. Um, Was this in between Emperor's New Groove, like, recording? That Madame Zeroni tells Elia that, I'll give you the run to the litter. And all you have to do is you have to take him up the mountain to a stream. And, and sing him a little song, which is kind of cute, really. I love that song, and I still sing it. If only, if only the woodpecker sighs, the bark on the trees just as soft as the sky. While the wolf waits below, hungry and lonely, he cries to the moon, if only, if only. It's very catchy, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like, I think of, I don't know why, but I still remember, I can tell you verbatim both the couplet and Vile Village in its entirety and also the song from VFD. I remember one time there was this kid in my college who was like really high during class and then he like laid out on the grass and started to recite the, if only, if only the woodpecker song like rhyme. And I was like, okay, something's going on with you. So Elliot has to take little piglet up the mountain. Oh, so cute. And feed it water and sing to it i don't really know why the song is necessary but it is cute well this is an old fortune teller thing 
It's just like good luck. It's like spinning on one's hand and shaking another person. Yeah, it's cute. He holds the little piggy. And this is the dual purpose of not only feeding the pig and making it big and fat, but it also makes Elia, this once kind of scrawny dude, into like this strapping young man who's still pretty young to decide he wants to marry someone, but that's neither here nor there. Um, and he has a great big old fat pig. Yes, and before he's about to leave for the last time, Madame Zeroni tells him, because it's a big day of asking for that girl's hand. Well, basically what happens is he neglects to take the pig up the mountain one last time, and instead decides to shower so that way he smells good. And then, the well, he actually asks Myrna's dad, and then Myrna's dad can't decide. Cause he's like, well, your pigs are exactly the same size, so I guess she can decide if she wants to. And then her head is completely empty like a flower pot, as they have mentioned multiple times. So she's sort of like, uh, I don't know, this really old weird man who doesn't love me at all, and it just is a creep who's like decades older than me or this nice p- boy who raised a pig for me i wonder who and she can't decide because she's an idiot i'm thinking of a number one yeah. to ten i you know what i'm kind of in the same boat of elio over here like he's put on all this work even though yeah she's such an idiot <laughs> like he probably would shoot her very right yeah even under the weird creepy circumstances he decides eff it i'm going to america America, the land of poison lizards. <laughs> and gold. Yeah, the streets are paved with gold and lizards. Of course, Elia forgets the promise to Madame Zeroni because she wanted to go up the mountain. Yeah, last last minute he's like, oh right, I'm on the boat already. <laughs> he really made that decision very quickly without really thinking. He never even thought that he was going to betray her and not bring her up the mountain because he was like, oh, yeah, I'll do it now because it's i he's friends with Madame Zeroni. He had no reason not to. So it's sort of like, well, I mean, it's kind of like he's angry and heartbroken. I guess. But so it's like, like what the- a dumb mistake to make. And he's like, all right, well, I don't believe in the curse. So see ya. But it was still kind of mean. Yeah. because I mean, yeah. And just imagine her waiting and then slowly, you know, dying because. He's, but, you know, the curse is going to happen. And it does happen because you're going to be cursed for all of eternity. Ha ha ha. And if you forget to bring Madame Zeroni up the hill, you and your family will be cursed <laughs> for always and eternity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. God is good. There you go. My best impression I got. Hey, anyone out there who who needs a an Eartha Kid impersonator, you got me, the whitest person in the world. <laughs> so, yeah, Madame Zeroni... Curses his family for always an eternity. As he goes to America and to watch American movies. And uh, Elia uh, doesn't kind of believe in the curse, but once he gets to America, so Elia goes to America, he finds a beautiful, strapping young American woman. Marries her. And she's not an idiot, too. She can do all of the things oh, that Oh, she can think for Zeroni, herself. Yeah. Most importantly, she could think for herself was, like, the main kind of takeaway from that. So he, he does he does learn a lot from Madame Zeroni's little he lesson. Does much, he, he gets much better <laughs> in the pick of life. Yeah. And a lot of unlucky things start to happen, such as his barn keeps being struck by lightning, even though I'm pretty sure he forgot to get a lightning rod. His livestock keeps dying. Stuff like horrible stuff keeps happening. So what he starts to do is he starts to go up to every random person, start asking him if they know anyone named Zeroni, and no one seems to know. And I kind of like this about this. It's just it's just a very simple story, and it's like you no, know, he gets the gets the point across. But we cut back to Stanley, and Stanley is having a terrible time. He's super cramped. He's super heated and super dehydrated. But, you know, he keeps doing the things that he's doing. And on the third day, he finds a gold cylinder that simply says KB. Which we will find out what that means. Not my initials reversed, but something else. Can you guess? (laughs) I think you can. (laughs) I think anybody reading this could probably guess what the KB stands for. KB Toys? Yep, that's exactly it. Speaking of dead, KB Toys is also dead. No, it's alive. What, really? It just got, it's back, yeah. Toys R Us is gone and now KB Toys is back? Yeah. Raised from the dead. Someone bought the name KB Toys and they're remaking Source. All right. Why not? 
I don't really think that's a financially wise decision, considering one of the biggest toy companies just completely failed, but you know. Of course, uh, Stanley being the nice guy kind of gets bullied into giving this lipstick to X-Ray. Yeah, he he basically says, oh, I've been here longer, so it's only fair that you give this to me, so that way I could have the day off. So, good old X-Ray, the next day, like, literally minutes after he's digging his first hole, says he finds it, and this is when the warden comes in, because I guess it's it's fit to be super interesting, and I kind of like the description, they, the, they basically made the, the warden... A ginger, which is like the worst place you could possibly be in, is in the middle of the desert with the hot sun. <laughs> yeah, well, she does have a hat. The whole time they were describing how hot and terrible it was, I was thinking about how I would just be sort of baked to a crisp if I was there. In the beginning, she's super nice and super friendly. Like, this doesn't seem like a person that makes kids dig mm-hmm. holes all day, every day. And you're like, we're all going to buddy up and we're going to start digging a perimeter as if they're looking for something. Yeah, so instead of digging individual holes, they build, like, this sort of cavernous A super system. hole. Yeah, like, looking for something. They don't know what, because the warden is kind of type- tight-lipped about everything. But really, if you're paying attention to a lot of the flashbacks and the kind of, like, foreshadowing stuff going on, you kind of have an idea a little bit. Yeah, because uh, while this is happening, uh, good old caveman... Is having more flashbacks again, but this time it's the old West. Yep, old timey West. And this is where we meet Catherine Barlow. Yes, basically her like origin story of how she goes from like this mild mannered, sweet school teacher to like one to of to a six shooting, tooting outlaw. Yeah, like, the, the most feared outlaw in all of the West, basically, um, sort of describes, like, all the bad stuff that happens to her. It's kind of a sad story, and I think I... like I, this story. I yeah. think this this could have been its own book, I think. Yeah, it reminds me a lot of, like, uh, like fried green tomatoes, sort of, like that, like, flashbacks to, like, a, a different time in the South when things were even worse. <laughs> yeah, I kind of thought of, like, Django Unchained a little bit, for some reason. Yeah, yeah, just, like, a lot of, like weird small town stuff it just really it specifically reminded me of like the setting of uh fried green tomatoes even though that's not in texas but it's kind of like this weird small town i guess and i i call it the old west story or a catherine story this is almost like game of thrones where each chapter just has a different name you follow that character catherine's a school teacher and she teaches both the kids and all the dumbass adults yeah so she has night school where she teaches adults and they're all kind of creeps Oh, no, not kind of. They are creeps. What are you talking about, B? You're being too generous to these creepy people. Yeah, the only reason they're there is so they could hit on her and make her feel uncomfortable. Because, surprise, surprise, men have been terrible for generations. <laughs> what? That's like the understatement of the century. Yeah. Uh, so while that's happening... Uh, she befriends the local onion seller, Sam. Yeah, the sweet onion seller man who sells onions that he collects from like his secret little onion patch his, his onion stash with his good old donkey mary lou yeah mary lou the adorable little donkey Catherine starts you know kind of falling for sam she starts asking him to do like schoolhouse stuff such as fix his roof fix a window fix her desk repultry like the ceiling like anything she can think of yeah he he just keeps fixing things and then She's sad because she runs out of things to fix, and so she can't spend any more time with him. So she goes up to Sam during a rainstorm, and when there's no one outside because this is the West, so everyone thinks it's, they have the Wicked Witch of the West syndrome. And it's almost like a Nicholas Sparks moment here. Yeah, they're like, run in the rain, and then he's like, oh, well. I'm a time traveler. I'll write you letters every day. <laughs> no, that's not it. <laughs> Well, in the movie, he's basically like, I can fix that, which is like such a Nicholas Sparks kind of line, but yeah. <laughs> no, no, it, it becomes a Nicholas Sparks line, which is like, I need help, I can't fix my heart, and he's like, I can fix that, and they have like this kiss in the rain, it's so beautiful, yeah. it's like a 360 spin, except Catherine Barlow is kissing a black man, that's un- that's that's against sin of God. Yeah, only her her language maybe isn't quite as generous as that. Yeah, everyone's a horrible racist. 
So they're, they're basically like, oh, she's going to hell because she did that and God will judge her. And they were like, want to run him out of town. Or no, they don't want to run him. Out. No, they want to lynch him. What are yeah, you talking they want, about? Yeah, they want to murder him. And then she, basically she goes to the sheriff. Is that who she goes to? Yeah. Yeah, the sheriff who's like drunk, super drunk. Because they burned down the schoolhouse because she kissed Sam. Education is now invalid. <sighs> yeah. Which is terrible, and I kind of like that they don't sugarcoat this at all, because it is completely awful what they do. They com- they they essentially yeah, it's a terrible racist nightmare, basically. Yeah, and also like the the main villain, uh, Trout Walker. Um, the best way to put this is he, uh, while he's burning down the schoolhouse, he's getting very touchy, touchy, feely, feely, ser- sexual harassmenty. Yeah, he's gross. He's a creepy yeah. dude. He's a creepy dude and a racist. Yeah. Which often go hand in hand. Who knew? It's almost like if you dehumanize one kind of person, you dehumanize all sorts of people. Wow. Wow. The more That's... you know, uh, yeah, he's a piece of garbage. This is like a shock. We should stop the presses. People that are mean to most people are awful human beings. Yeah. And water's wet. But not at Camp Green Lake. Then we get like weird, creepy sheriff dude who's like, you know, if you give me a kiss, I won't hang yeah, this man everyone is just like constantly sexually harassing this character i just feel really terrible for her like she just can't do anything no i don't feel terrible for her because no wonder she like becomes like a crazy outlaw that kills people yeah no i feel really bad like yeah she completely justified that she becomes a vigilante <laughs> completely justified that she goes roaming stealing rich people's money fine you deserve that 100 percent You've been through the ringer. Trout Walker, with his mechanized boat machine, shoots... Actually, no, rams in the movie they shoot him in the in the book. They, he rams into Sam's boat, uh, killing Sam, drowning him. Uh, Catherine, who's also in the boat, swims to shore and sees Mary Lou has been shot in the head. Which is so sad. Poor little donkey. She wasn't even... She was just a little donkey. She didn't do anything. <laughs> she was just helping him sell his onion wares. What are you buying? What are you selling? <laughs> yeah, like an NPC in a video game. <laughs> Hi, would you like to buy some onion wares? <laughs> it's like underwear, but not. <laughs> <laughs> My onion wares. That, that, that reminds me of, um, no, wait, onion, um, uh, underwears is from the, the room with the guy. I, I misplaced my underwears. Oh, God, you're right. I haven't seen the room in a minute. The poor onion man. He can't fix that situation, unfortunately. So the next week, Catherine Barlow shoots dead the sheriff, but she didn't shoot the deputy. Was there a deputy? I think there was. He was probably racist, too. No, I know it's a song. She just guns down racist people? Yeah. Like, they literally all deserve it. I I have a lot of empathy for her as a character. I feel like we need to get shirts that say, uh, Kiss and Kate Barlow did nothing wrong. <laughs> So Catherine Barlow changes her name to Kissin' Kate Barlow, and she becomes an outlaw, robbing and stealing and protecting people that cannot be protected. And she does this for about 20 years. Uh, She comes back to Green Lake, which is now dried up ever since Sam died. There has been no rain, so no water to replenish the lake. The whole town turns into a ghost town. Kate Barlow, Kissin' Kate buries all of her loot in the town yeah she hides it which i love this this part is so good because trout walker who's somehow gotten himself a wife yeah a, a wife who like looks like a sort of like ratchet like sort of not as good version of a grosser version of kiss and kate if i remember <laughs> like the description of her <laughs> oh, oh so you're the disc the dollar store kiss and kate yeah sort of off-brand smooshing cat it's a smoochin' cat. Oh, I want a smoochin' cat. <laughs> I don't want a cat to smooch. It's like the knockoff brand instead of like... Kiss and Kate would be a great name um, for a cat. So they try to get Kiss and Kate to like, give him the treasure. Which is not gonna happen. Not gonna happen. And they like, drag her out into the middle of the lake when all of a sudden a yellow spotted lizard comes out and bites Kiss and Kate on the ankle, or the Achilles tendon, and she laughs herself to death. And they'll never find the treasure in a million billion years and they'll have to dig all these holes and they'll never find it. 
That doesn't create some sort of like decade long or like longer than that, like a, a family generational yeah, problem. Yeah, a generational revenge quest to like find the treasure hidden in the lake bed or anything. Totally forget when days are. They just know how many holes they've dug. Which I guess is one a day, so. It's one a day, yeah. But, you know, you lose sense of time. The weather doesn't change because it doesn't rain. It doesn't do anything. It's just hot and miserable. One of the days, the water truck comes and all of the boys gather up and the truck leaves. And guess what? Magnet has stolen a bag of sunflower seeds. Yeah, because uh, Mr. Sir is a jerk and he deserves it. And they start playing with the seeds and Stanley wants nothing with it. And they try to throw the bag and Stanley, because of this bad luck, falls open leaving all the seeds into his little hole. And of course, Mr. Sir comes back because he wants his seeds. Stanley ain't no snitch. So he says that he ate a 40-pound bag of seeds by himself. Which, that would destroy your insides, I think. (laughs) Of course, Mr. Sir being really smart. So yeah, he did it, so I'm going to take him to the warden. This is where I think the warden becomes a really good villain. And how, like, she's like... She doesn't really care about Stanley, but she cares about Mr. Sir enough that, like, I guess she's she got, like, nail polish that's made out of snake venom. Yeah, and she creepily, like, sort of waves it in front of Stanley's face and then scratches and which is Here comes, yeah. you know, uh, human basic rights being violated for the next couple of days. Mr. Sir refuses to fill up Stanley's water bottle with water. And also Mr. Sir is now in a terrible tantrum, basically fighting kids and choking them it's a nightmare they get really abusive really fast well mr sir does i mean half of his face is puffed up because of stanley yeah because of the weird poison that she scraped across his face it's kind of a horrifying and while this is going on when uh, stanley came back he discovered that his hole was completely dug by zero and all throughout this time as well stanley's been writing to his mom lying about what's been going on like, oh, you know, we're going to do water skiing and rock climbing and all this stuff. Like, he doesn't want to say it's a terrible time to worry her. Yeah, he he doesn't even mention the fact that the lake doesn't exist. Yeah, he completely creates this fiction. Uh, Zero comes in while he's writing one of his letters, and Zero can't read or write. And they make a deal right there and then that if Zero helps him dig his hole, Stanley will teach him how to read and write. Yeah, that's like the trade-off, but... Yeah, he's not super forthright about the fact that he can't read, so it's kind of like the other campers don't really know the situation that they have worked out, so they just think that he's taking advantage of Zero's ability to dig holes really well. Yeah, because Stanley is lazy and fat and doesn't shouldn't do anything. Not to mention like the kind of weird race dynamic of the fact that like Zero's a black kid and he's like a white kid, like bossing him around to have him dig yeah, his holes. Like that's yeah, that's one theme that happens in the story. That's I, that's actually a theme of this book of dealing with racism though there's one line in this book that i love it's pretty much like there was you know all these kids are different races but the sand always covers them so they're pretty much always the same right yeah they mentioned that early on in the book that's like a descriptor of like when he first meets the campers i feel like yeah that's like a good metaphor for like the the way that they all kind of like become bonded together through their universal experience yeah in the past when this lake was a lake race mattered but once the lake dried up race doesn't matter well yeah i mean they're they're in in this specific circumstance i I wouldn't say that it stops mattering entirely just in the universe that they live in because america but yeah no in this particular their universe not the world in their microchasm it doesn't matter because they're all kind of like on the same level if if anything the only hierarchy is the people who work at the camp like um mr sir and And the warden who they keep calling mom yeah creepy i keep i I always want to say mom i keep thinking mum i don't know i don't think that's kind of weird i just think it's just eh. well i mean they they mention it sort of like they find it kind of weird and they don't really know the um the situation they've worked out together because they don't know that zero can't read understandably i mean if you're here to dig holes and someone's helping to dig another person's hole i mean i would imagine you'd have problems especially when it's hot and you're high dehydrated and all this stuff i can, I can see where the, the other kids are coming from oh yeah after a day of digging a hole i think i would be angry enough to kill someone <laughs> like i would be so hangry and mean to people yeah so as this is happening one of the kids <laughs> spills the beans they don't even get hot showers no they get cold showers remember they just get cold showers for like a minute Two minutes. And there's apparently, like, they, they, they joked with Stanley that there's microphones and stuff and cameras. 
Yeah, it's not a great time. Zigzag spills the beans that Zero's been helping him dig this hole. And Zero gets so mad because it's Mr. Pendensky, who's basically the worst human. I think he's the worst human being in the story. Oh, he's terrible. He just, like, you know. Berates Zero because he's an idiot. Encourages them to, like, fight and, like, tells Zero that he's, like, a loser and an idiot and that he doesn't know anything. He's, like the worst possible person for this job because he's pretending like he's helping these kids and then he just like says all this like really mean stuff well i mean i i'm sure if you're a counselor here you have like some weird anger issues or record this is pretty much a slave camp yeah it's like indentured servitude it's not a good time it's it's like a work camp it's not i feel like it it wouldn't be legal (laughs) really like these kids aren't even of legal age to like be tried as adults they're all like teenagers it would be illegal if they weren't given their basic human... Oh, wait, no, no, they don't, because sometimes they're, you know, water deprivation and they get awful food. I visited a prison once for law class in high school, and it was weird because, like, we were a law class, so we were there to, like, learn about prison, I guess, but the way that the program was set up felt way more like a kind of scared straight program, so they kind of just, like, yelled at us for, like, 40 minutes about drugs, and then we, like got to eat prison food well i didn't eat it i got to look at it but i didn't want to eat it because it was like imagine cafeteria food but like worse it was like that oh so public school food got it no but like worse than that even it was is i mean it's from like the same company basically that does like cafeteria food for schools but just really disgusting stuff i mean maybe they might have got confused wait this isn't the scared straight class oh no yeah like literally i feel like they just they like they're like what are you here for again like it's like none of us are on drug like wh- they're like okay who here has been on crack none of us have been on crack we're from the suburbs like what are you talking about like why are you yelling at us <laughs> my sister went on the same trip and this one kid was like raised his hand when they were just like okay has anyone done more than like pot or whatever raised his hand he's like i've done ketamine and they were like what who does ketamine and, like even the people in prison were like what the what the hell dude like what <laughs> <laughs> you're 16 what but yeah so zero does the right thing and bashes his face in with a shovel yeah and he runs away into the desert Without his water bottle, of course. Yeah, because that's smart. You're you're not going to dry up like a raisin out there. Two days go by and no one has seen Zero. Luckily, in that time, they've just assumed he's dead, that his vacancy has been replaced by a new kid named Twitch, who has stolen a car. Yeah, a real big-time crime. Stealing a car, not like stealing some shoes. Stanley is really missing Zero because he was a really good person. And again, who wants to die pretty much... You know what the weirdest thing is? Someone that dies from dehydration in the middle of the desert because they get mummified. Oh, that's horrible. Yeah, there was a professor, I think, of earth science or something, but it was like 2005 or six. He just said, hey, I'm going to walk all of Death Valley, which is Why would someone do that to themselves? He he calculated how much water he would need to get to the other end, but he forgot to calculate the amount he would need back trip. Oh, no. So they found him like three weeks later. He was completely like mummified. That's really horrible. Wow, way to like mess up some crucial math, my dude. <laughs> this is why I don't go into nature. <laughs> I love nature. I, I like I like nature in small doses, but I, I have constant fears of bad things happening. Or just like you know, like those Discovery Channel shows where they're just like, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, be, shouldn't alive. be alive. Yeah, <laughs> they're just like we were attacked by scorpions, and then we got into a boat, and there was a shark, and all of my friends were eaten. I just imagine like I shouldn't be alive. So this is my tale of how I made it out of Camp Green Lake. Oh yeah, that's definitely an I shouldn't be alive story for sure. On the back trip, Mister Sir has brought his truck, and they're filling up the water bottles, and Stanley's like, I'm gonna. I'm going to go save Zero. So he hops in the truck. And because he's like a 12-year-old kid, he doesn't know how to drive. He drives the car straight into a hole. Yeah. And decides to run uh, into the desert. I love that. Uh, uh, What's his name? Twitchy. Not Twitchy. What is it? <laughs> Twitch. Yeah. How he like directs him on how to drive. Because he's like, I've st- <laughs> stolen a car before, so I know how to drive. You got to turn the clutch. I mean, how can a 12-year-old, like, move a clutch? That thing's, like, impossible, even for... I can't even know how to do clutch. It sucks. That's the real miracle of this story. Is that they don't die when he gets in the car? So Stanley runs into the desert, also without a water bottle. 
Yeah, dude, grab some water. What the hell? And now he's walking through the middle of the desert. And after a while, and he sees a lot of mirages and, you know, deja vu. Yeah, he starts to think he sees water and then there's no water. And he's, he's basically... Like looking around, like oh maybe Zero's like dead in one of those holes over there, and then he like he sees some like le- yellow spotted lizards in the holes, and it's a bad time. It's a creepy time. Doesn't help that all the holes are like the perfect like habitat for the yellow spotted lizards because they like to find shade in the hole. Oh, and also they're like gravestones, pretty much. So then after a while, Stanley sees in the distance a mirage, but it's not. It's a overturned boat. Ironically, on the thing it says. Mary Lou. Mary Lou. The sweet little donkey. Again, history coming around full circle. And he finds Zero's there and he's been underneath his boat eating peaches. Eating peaches. Well, mm, they used to be peaches, maybe. They're not jarred peaches. It's jarred botulism. Yeah, it's a nightmare. It's it's bad. Like, I would imagine, like, both it being extremely hot and then probably, like, really cold, those glass jugs would have exploded. Yeah, they probably would have. Yeah, and Zero seems to be having a great time just drinking his... Like, he loves it. He's like, mm, you want, I want some? And then, like, uh, Stanley has some, but he's sort of like, all right, well, this used to be peaches. I don't really know what it is now. They decide we can have two options. We can go back to camp, or they see off in the distance a man that looks like a thumb. And that is God's thumb. The affirmation thumb. Because conveniently, this is also where... Stanley's great great grandfather was abandoned. Yep, what a coincidence! It's all coming together. It's like fate. Well, because remember, he was robbed by kissing Kate Barlow, but he survived because he wasn't kissed by her. So he just was like left to die of exposure. But he found refuge on God's thumb, also known as this weird rock formation in the middle of the desert that used to be an ocean. No, not an ocean, a lake. I'm I'm not smart. Anyway, it's like everything's coming together. Swing away, Stanley. Swing yeah, away. Yeah, all of the threads overlapping. They decide to climb up the mountain, and it's like a terrible time because Zero's getting violently sick. Surprise, surprise. Because he ate all these weird peaches he found under a boat. I mean, I get he was hungry, but don't just eat strangers' peaches that you found in the desert. That's crazy. Unless the guy's name's actually Peaches. If a, if a stranger named Peaches offers you some peaches. Don't take them. Yeah, definitely don't take them. So they climb up this mountain, and Zero's getting violently sick to the point of where Stanley has to carry Zero up the mountain. Yeah, good old Hector Zerone. Oh, we forgot the most important part as well about this we're talking about. Like, the big reveal that is Hector Zerone. Yeah, he's like, wait a second. This weird throwaway line, because Stanley overhears one night. We have to, like, you know, pretend this kid didn't exist, so there's no investigation. So they pretty much... Commit fraud? Yeah, they'd want to, like, delete him from, like, the records. The government website, which, which I just... Which is, how do you do that? I don't know. Like, how do these old people know how to hack into this website? Like... I they Just imagine, they live in the middle of, like, bump truck nowhere. They probably have dial-up. Yeah, like, I just... I really can't imagine that these kind of, like, middle-aged people know how to, like, hack into the mainframe of, like, the government and, like, delete this kid's identity. I just, like, imagine, like, Mr. Pendinsky's just tapping on the keyboard and he's just like, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, it's like, this isn't Mr. Robot. Like, they, these, like, demographic of people most definitely would not know how to hack into something as complicated as that and delete him, but whatever, let's just, like, brush that aside. So they they do it. So they they climb up this mountain and they finally get to the top and there's nothing quite there. Except, you know, they're being stung by bugs and stuff, and they realize they're standing in water. They have to dig for it. Yeah, they have to dig for it. Of course, Stanley sings to Zero while he's, you know, passed out. His little the one song, song about the woodpecker. To keep their spirits up, and as if, like magic, Zero wakes up and starts drinking water, and they start eating hot-ass onions. Yeah, weird onions that they find on the top of this thumb. A hundred-year-old onion. Actually, I don't think... I mean, onions probably do expire, but these are probably not the original onions. No, yeah, no, the onions are growing. They, like, pull them up. The onions are new. The peaches are very old. <laughs> so they spend, like, three weeks up eating nothing but onions, just being bros. Yeah. <laughs> Two bros chilling on a god's thumb. <laughs> Twelve feet of fart, because they stole shoes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh my god, they were roommates. They have a family history. (laughs) Uh, While this is happening, Zero confesses that he was the one that stole the shoes. Yeah, and he tells, like, the whole story about how 
he used to be homeless, and then his his mom kind of just like one day abandoned him. And that Zero basically lived in a playground for a while. Yeah, he had like nowhere to go. So he went to the homeless shelter and he saw the shoes and stole them, but realized that, you know, they must have been important. So he throws them off the roof, which hits Stanley, thus, you know, causes a series of unfortunate events. And then, of course, the irony of ironies, Zero gets arrested the next day for stealing a different pair of shoes. And they decide, we're just going to go back to camp because they need to dig one more hole. Because if they can get the money, Stanley realizes that kissing Kate Barlow probably left her money over there because the KB and the, there was the lipstick. If they can get the money and get some food, they can live for the rest of their lives without, you know, worrying. So they run down the mountain. Well, maybe uh, not run down, to... but they kind of scale back down the mountain. Yeah, they're like little mountain goats. Yeah, they're still a little bit woozy. They're... Except they smell terrible. They smell like onions and like Weird fermented raw sewage, probably. Peaches and people who haven't bathed in forever who've sat on top of a mountain. Yeah, it's a bad time. And they, they climb down the mountain. And they get back to Camp Green Lake, and this is where they start digging the hole in the middle of the night. And surprise, surprise, there's treasure there. Ta-da! And they get the suitcase, and of course, the wardens had seen the entire thing. She's in the midst of her weird fraud of trying to delete Zero from the files or whatever. She, like, appears and is like, oh, well, I guess he's alive. And, of course, you know, luck is just really lucky right now because a bunch of yellow spotted lizards decide to, like, hop up on Stanley and Zero. But they do not bite them. No, but luckily it's also Stanley's lucky day because uh, he was supposed to be released because they found out he was innocent. Yeah, his lawyer apparently showed up, which he didn't even know he had a lawyer, but we'll get to that. But, so they spend the entire night in this hole, and they don't move, because if they move, the lizards might bite them and kill them very painfully. And terminally. (laughs) Oh, yeah. D-E-E-D. Dead. Yep, that's how you spell it. The next day, they hear a car roll up, and it's Stanley's new lawyer. Apparently. With another young fellow. And then they, they can only hear that the warden... Warden Walker, we'll just call her that because she's so happy because they found the treasure. And do you know what is very important about the fact that her last name is Walker? I don't know. That's Trout's last name. Oh my god. So. They were related. Yeah. Generational, weird, obsessive search for Kate Barlow's hidden stash of money. And she is not going to let, like, she was, she's willing to shoot Stanley and Zero for this money. For all they know, there could be no, it would have been funny if they, if there was nothing. It was like, the real treasure was friendship all along. Yeah, though, I mean, his, Stanley's family needed it. So there, there is, in fact, treasure inside of the box. Yeah, it's not like One-Eyed Willie's treasure. Yeah, it's not metaphorical. So the lawyer tells him that Stanley's going to be released. Basically, they, they can't do anything about it until Stanley realizes that the lizards aren't going to bite him. At all, because they had seen a tarantula be eaten by one of the lizards. So he gets up with the the suitcase, and good old old Warden Walker tries to say this is Stanley stole the suitcase. And of course, Zero now knowing how to read realizes the suitcase was actually belonged to great, 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 great granddad Stanley's. Which is lucky, because their name is the same, and also it's very easy to remember his last name, because it's just his first name backwards. So it's Stanley Yilnaz. Uh, the camp is pretty much shut down because of fraud. And uh, numerous other illegal things, probably. <laughs> oh, yes. And then because they delete Hector's name and stuff in the database, so they take Hector with them and they drive away. Cut to a year later and everything is good. They have millions of dollars because they open the thing up and there's just gold and every like every and jewels little and like and like stocks from like a really long time ago that are worth a lot now yes and it turns out that sweet feet has married hector's mom because they found hector's mom through a private investigation yeah it's all it's like very disney ending they kind of wrap it up real <laughs> nicely that stanley's dad has made an invention that makes uh smelly ass shoes smell like sweet peaches so they call it Sploosh. Yep. After the weird nickname Zero gave, like, the gross peach stuff he found in the desert. Yeah, and the the story kind of ends with that the Camp Green Lake is going to be a Girl Scout camp. 
No, every, as long as they eat their onions, everything will be all right. Yeah, they won't be bit by the creepy lizards. And they all live happily ever after. The end. That's how it ends. It's it's everything's so wrapped up nicely. I love this story. It's so good. Yeah, I really liked it. I I enjoyed reading it. It really made me nostalgic for the movie. I'm excited to like do our commentary on that. Yeah, I feel like a lot of it was super similar to the movie. I think, like, I guess the main difference is Zero talks a little bit in this. Well, like, in the movie, there's sort of, like, the big, like, moment where he does, like, speak, but he normally doesn't. Yeah, where he says, like, he says Stanley Yilnaz is the suitcase. And I also like the ending more of having, like, there has revealed his last name, Zeroni, at the end when they open it up. And it was like, what's your last name? Zeroni. I like that more, though, because it's like, it, it's not, it, in the book, he doesn't treat it as an important event, like, oh my god. Yeah, but like, if you're paying attention, it's, it's pretty easy to piece it together um, early on in the book. But again, YA, so maybe some people wouldn't realize it. I think the great thing about this is that, again, everything has a setup and a payoff. Mm-hmm. doesn't matter, like, the, all three stories come together in such a brilliant way. As well as, you know, I think the main theme that I love about this book is kind of like, you can look at the past and see how awful people were and how you have this new situation the same location same spit of dirt and everyone's treated this differently yeah you know much more even though they're not treated fairly the kids come together they look past you know their own you know criminal behavior their own you know their own views their own you know race they're all one all they do is dig holes all day i found it really funny that actually the the setting of this is like a sort of juvenile detention center when i like uh percy jackson also starts at like a school for like delinquents basically so it's kind of like a similar thing of like and they both wear orange shirts yeah that's true (laughs) you're right and there's camps involved oh my god then everything else is very different but (laughs) i like that there's like unity as well as like this book doesn't also sugarcoat the idea of racism and also fraud and all these horrible things yeah yeah they're they're pretty over your head with a lot of like really intense themes and stuff so they don't they don't really pull punches with that i really liked it i i enjoyed reading it a lot like there's like so much you could say about this book there's so many different angles you can take with it but i feel like it's just a very very solid story i had so much fun reading it yeah i love the flashbacks i love how it all kind of like works together that it's like this weird like family history thing that like goes way back and you know everybody is like involved like the 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 warden is related to Trout, and he's related to, you know, his great great grandfather, and then Hector is related to Madame Zeroni. Like they're all like connected in the past somehow, and then there's like this weird event that somehow brings them all together again. Well, yeah, because if it wasn't for like these situations, they would never have you know been at Camp Green Lake. Which I also like that the second that the treasure's found, it starts to rain. Yeah, it's like oh, the curse is broken. If you were paying attention, the second you know. Stanley starts, you know, singing to Zero and stuff. All of a sudden, their luck starts to change. He carries a Zeroni up the mountain. So it's... Especially, like, I always get misty at the end when they're all talking about, like, we'll see you on the other side. And, like, they're just all, everyone's so happy. Yeah, it's a, it's a really, like, satisfying end to the book. There's, like, no, like, big questions at the end. You're just like, ah, yes, everything's wrapped up neatly, which, like, I don't know, some people might criticize that. But, like, every once in a while, it's nice to read something that kind of has a happy ending. But, I mean, you look at all these kids who have pretty much been, like, punched and shoved through life. I love this book. I think everyone should read it. I I know that it's on, like, a lot of curriculums for, like, required reading in some schools. Yeah, I don't really know why I wasn't assigned it. I guess it was, like, amongst the books you could choose to read for class, and I just didn't pick it or something as, like, an independent thing. I know there's actually a sequel to this book, but it's not really related. It's called Small Steps. Yeah, it's like a spin-off. Yeah, it's a spin-off of one of the characters. Yeah, it's it's called Small Steps and I would love to read that book, but I I don't know. I feel like it would it would kind of ruin Yeah, this... everything's so neatly wrapped up. I kind of just like to leave it here. <laughs> yeah, I I really enjoyed it. Um I had a feeling I would cuz I I really loved the movie as a kid and they're like so similar that it's like you can I can't even really think of more than a couple of things that are different. Um the only other thing is like I guess Stanley's overweight in this at first and then he loses weight but i do believe that the reason that they didn't cast an overweight person for the role of stanley in the movie was that like he would have had to lose a bunch of weight for the role it would also be very impractical what if they had to do pickup shots yeah exactly it would have been like a whole thing so and like shia labeouf like 
auditioned and did a good job. So uh, I think who else? Oh, um, he... who else auditioned? Um, do you know? One second, it's gonna come to me. It's another kid actor. Uh, start naming kid actors. I can probably tell you. Uh, I'm trying to think of a kid oh, actor. Oh, oh, oh! Now I remember. Time. Okay. Oh. Uh, the the other person that auditioned but turned it down because he was doing it. He was doing a show at the time. Was Frankie Muniz was supposed to be standing? Oh, Frankie Muniz. Um, I could see that. They're like they play similar characters, I would say. Like, yeah, they're which I can see Frankie Muniz doing this really well. But Frankie I think... Muniz would probably be like more of a deadpan Stanley. I could, I feel like his delivery would be a little bit more snarky. Even though like Shia LaBeouf has gone off the deep end in recent years, I still <laughs> love him. <laughs> no, he's like not so but so, but in a good way. Yeah, I mean, if you've seen like his life prior to even Steven, like there's actually just there's a reason why he's not so but so. Yeah, he's a weird dude. But he's got a heart of gold, I think. Maybe. I don't know. Heart of gold. I mean, he knows how to take a joke about himself. That's true. Next month, we're going to be reading a book suggested to us by one of our Patreons. Patreons. Named Elliot. Woo! Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of this specific patron because I am dating them. (laughs) And I live in an apartment with them. But I'm just biased. But I'm sure that their suggestion is very nice. If not, we'll tell you if it's terrible. Oh, well, are you promising? No, I will reread it. I will tell you if it's good. If it's not, you can do whatever you want. And also, if you don't like it, you can do whatever you want. Okay, if I if I don't like it, we'll we'll read it and we'll tell you. I'll I'll read it. I'll tell you, and then you can read it and tell me that. Okay. Well, you need to know before next week because we we need to. I'll go back. I'll I'll stop by Patterson. I'll grab it. I definitely have it in me. All right. So next week we're going to be reading. Uh, Rowan Hood, outlaw girl of Sherwood Forest. Yeah, so basically Robin Hood, but a girl. Chicks and bows. Like disguised as a boy. Yeah, exciting. Yeah, it's it's real. Uh, it's English Mulan. Oh, oh yeah, I was gonna say it's like Mulan, but it's also like you know Joan of Arc. There we go. It it came to me. <laughs> I was gonna say the, you know the French one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, French Mulan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it is French Mulan when you think about it. Yeah. <laughs> It's not not French Milan. But yeah, so that's what we're going to be reading. Uh, where can they find you, B? Uh, you can find me on Tumblr at twinpoetry.tumblr.com, and you can find me on Twitter at B. Kelly Gorman. If you want to find me, you can find me on Twitter at Suda41. That's S U D A 41. If you want to keep continuing to donate to our Patreon, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, we love doing these little bonus episodes, and we've we've made some money off this, so it's super exciting, and every dollar helps us, you know, get new equipment, get new books, especially just keep the lights on so we can keep podcasting, and, you know, so you can hear us all the time, driving, sleeping, all those wonderful places. Just constantly, just us talking about books forever until you die. Until we run out of books. Yeah. Well, there's no lack of books. No, I think there's like 4,000 books a day that are published. Yeah. Something insane. But you can follow us on Patreon slash Radio Camp Half-Blood. I'm Zach. I'm B. Goodbye. (laughs) Goodbye.